So today, you know, it's, rec it's a recognised institution. An Aboriginal community controlled health service is recognised by most people, you know, in, in the area of Aboriginal health. But uh, it shouldn't be forgotten, you know, that the fight that, uh, that had to take place and uh, the struggle to, to establish AMSs and to get them up and running and to grow to what they are today. I think there are about 10 medical services when the AHMRC was first established. Just going through the past, getting ready for the, the 30 year um, celebration, um, you know, there are so many of our mob who have passed on and uh, who were all strong people and played an important role in the establishment of the HMRC, whether they were on the board for a short while or a uh, long while. And um, they've all, and you know, several of those people have passed away and um, I guess I'd pay tribute to them as well. Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services in New South Wales really started to form a coherent and powerful voice in the 1980s. Up until then, we had important grandmother organisations like Redford, Melbourne, uh, Congress and Alice Springs. These grandmother organisations carried the weight and created the opportunities for so many new organisations to start. So I guess there were, there were two driving forces here. One was the, the task force, the ministerial task force into Aboriginal health um, that, that delivered the Brereton report. And uh, there was also, I think, um, just a, an, a logical sort of progression from the AMSs who were, who were sort of um, uniting at the national level to do the same on the state level and uh, to represent the interests of Aboriginal medical services who have struggled to become established, you know, by volunteers in the communities, um, setting up AMSs to meet that great unmet health need for Aboriginal people. For Aboriginal affairs and Aboriginal rights, you really have to go back to the Freedom Ride in 65. And what happened from then? It was putting Aboriginal affairs on the front burner. The Redfern AMS helped a number of medical services set up around the country. And I think it was just that word of mouth, people who came to the city and saw what Redfern was doing and perhaps um, Birupai up at Tari and, and other organisations and uh, decided this was really what they needed in their communities. I, I came to Sydney in around 1967, 68 um, and, and I always loved football. Got involved with a team here called the Redfern All Blacks. There was about 25, 28 of us that knocked around together and played together and all that sort of stuff. You know, in, in, uh, before they reached 50, we lost about 14 of them. And that was the morbidity rates amongst Aboriginal men in, in, in Sydney at, the, at that time. The whole existence of the, uh, what was then the Aboriginal Health Resource Committee, AHRC, uh, grew out of the National Trachoma and Eye Health Program. I mean, people were going blind from cataracts and all that, so we set up a whole eye health program here in New South Wales. We got in touch with Fred Hollows and a few others and all that and they, and they helped us along the way and uh, of course we had Naomi Mayers that was the, the first and, uh, and, and still is the, the CEO here um, and that's been 42 years and probably Australia's longest serving CEO, black or white, male or female. But we also had Murray Brashear that went on to become the governor of the state. We had Andrew Refshorgi that was the former deputy uh, uh, premier of New South Wales. He came here and worked here for, for nine years and we had to say, tell him, listen mate, we're not, um, we can't afford you to be here for the tenth year because we've got long service leave and all that. So he then took up a career in, um, in, in, in politics. Uh, we had Paul Tazillo was another outstanding person and he used to volunteer as a driver. We, we used to have clinics here at night. Uh, we had a lot of doctors that used to, when their, when their private practice finished, they'd come in and work for a couple of hours in the evening. You know, we had Gary Foley worked here. Um, Gary Williams was our first Aboriginal president. Marcia Langton worked here, Bobby Sykes, Dennis Walker. I remember Naomi always saying, oh, those fellas from Walgett, you know, coming down. So what they did, what Redfin did, is uh, put their mobile dental van out in the northwest for a long time. And from that had ramifications for us that we knew we needed oral health as part of health care. So we were very fortunate with Redfern's assistance to um, achieve dental clinics out there. So I was talking to some other women and they, 
And I said, I was thinking of going to Redfern. I said, I hear a lot about there, you know, how they help them Aboriginal people and that. And anyhow, when I went, uh, I went down on the train and I stayed at, uh, it used to be called the People's Palace, I think. Palace. Yeah. And anyhow, I stayed there and I, the next morning I got up, I went up to Redfern and uh, when I walked in, there was, there was a man and uh, two men and a woman standing there. And I said, excuse me, can you tell me, because I needed glasses. I said, can you tell me where I can see a doctor about my eyes? And, and they said, oh, yes, uh, point to a door, go up over there. And when I came out, they were still there. And I went over to thank them and I said, I, I wish I had a a medical service like this in Wellington. And they said, oh, why haven't you got one? And we said, I said, no. I said, there's a lot of people out west, I said, and they need something like this. And Charlie Perkins, Charlie looked at me and he said, well, why, have, why, why haven't you got one? I said, because we've got no money. <laughs> I said, you've got to have money to start these things. And he looked at, there was Naomi Mayers and there was Sol Belair. And, and he said, well, I'm sure these people might help you, and they did. Well, I've been to many places around so just walking in the doors, you know, you feel comfortable. It's a one-stop shop for our Bob passion. We're welcoming. <laughs> well, my heart keeps on beating to the winds that keep on falling. The only way we can become healthy um, is look at the environment we live in, um, good housing, good infrastructure with clean running water. Um, these are the uh, necessities that we need for good health. Education and employment in the Western Islands culture, which is here, it's going to be here for a long time and we've got to uh, be able to adapt and change and take control and maybe even become better at doing these things, you know. And, and start leading. It's, um, and I see that as a way forward, as a challenge for our younger generations coming through. Um, they need to have the fire in the belly. They need to hold their head up and be proud of, to be an Aboriginal and, and know that it's one of the oldest cultures on this planet. And, um, and knowing that, take pride in it and move forward and help our elders be comfortable in the remainder of their life. cultural aspect of an AMS uh, not only makes it accessible but relevant and the programs can be so easily tailored around the community because the community is so involved. It's always nice to walk through a door and see a friendly face or you know another Aboriginal person look back at you. Uh, I know it does put a lot of the local community people at ease knowing that the centre is for them and um, it's a place where they can go you know, for their families and for themselves. Um, it's also a central hub for the community. Um, to come and share stories. Uh, looking back at to the mid 70s, the difficulties that Aboriginal people had in Newcastle to actually access medical uh, facilities was quite was quite hard. And you know, we look at what we have now. We have a dentist service. Uh, we have uh, we have a mums and bubs group. We have um, general practitioners. We all know that Aboriginal health is is a lot worse than um, mainstream or non-Indigenous people. And I guess it is up to us as Aboriginal people to educate our own about. What, what are the things that we need to be looking at? So what we're doing is we're developing new ways of engaging with our people. We're listening to what our people are saying. And then through the AMS, we are really trying to take the leadership role into proving that to be healthy, we need to do it together. And we need to understand that making them healthy choices, is not just for us, but our families, but also our communities. You know, my daughters, they're gonna be growing up and I'd like, for see, I'd like for them to live in a world, I guess, where there is no gap. I'd love for them to be in a world where Aboriginal people no longer are targeted or you know behind the eight ball when it comes to health. I think the legacy we'd like to leave for our children is that certainly they're health, healthy and well, but I think they have an education that gives them the opportunity to be involved in the workplace. It'd be great for us to train our people, um, to give them employment opportunities and make the culture in their home 
where their children are seeing them become doctors and health workers. And with the AH and MRC College, we became an RTO through VTAB, which was absolutely magnificent. And there were other non-Aboriginal people along the way who uh, supported, put their hand in their pocket, and that was, God bless Brian Holden and Professor Brian Leyland. Sandra and I were real chuffed when uh, Governor Bashir, now our Dame, Dame Mari, Dame Mari has worked with Aboriginal Medical Services for many years and she put her hand on her heart and she said she's our patron and it's just been great. I think that's, you know, that's strength and unity and support for uh, each other sort of, um, you know, really made the sector strong and uh, it, without that unity and some agitation and uh, advocacy, you know, we wouldn't have the sector that we have today. And my grandfather, his name was John May and he used to always say to me, Joycey, when you go to meetings, you've got to speak up. He said, don't be afraid to speak out. He said, but the main thing is someone has to listen. Well, I've been to many places around this great land And I felt the ocean 